yet to offend anyone. I'm not finished. <laughs> Good well, I, maybe. Is anyone offended? No. <laughs> Only you, David. Only you. I'm done, not offended, Gary. <laughs> I'm actually rather, uh, I don't know. You keep covering okay. yourself up. Okay. <laughs> the Constitution would not have been ratified without the promise of the Bill of Rights. Pretty simple. It would never have happened. While it was not explicitly stated as a condition of ratification, three of the most powerful states, New York, Massachusetts, Virginia, all had sizable enough minorities with enough political muscle to block ratification had proponents balked at including a Bill of Rights. Every one of the first ten amendments to the Constitution was born from arguments leveled against the unamended final draft of the document. In fact, the original Bill of Rights was prefaced with a revealing preamble, which I just read to you. Only four members of the Philadelphia Convention actively pressed for a Bill of Rights, George Mason, Elbridge Gerry, and Luther Martin, and Charles Pinckney. Does anyone, Mr. Elbridge Gerry became famous because they kind of used his name in a different context years later. Oh, We've all heard of gerrymandering. Yeah because he went back and started changing districts around to get the votes the way he wanted. On 12 September 1787, just five days before the final draft of the Constitution was signed, Mason rose and said a Bill of Rights, particularly an express protection of trial by jury, would give great quiet to the people. In response, Jerry most meant, motioned that a committee be formed to prepare a Bill of Rights. Roger Sherman immediately rejected it, not because he opposed civil liberties, but because from a state's rights perspective, he thought it was unnecessary. Now, several founders took the point of saying a Bill of Rights was unnecessary. Alexander Hamilton was one. James Wilson from Pennsylvania was one. Several of them said it is not necessary because what may happen is you may forget some of your rights when you include them in there, and that wouldn't mean that the government would have them. Mm -hmm. If you forget to list them, then the government would have them. So we need to be careful of this. So therefore, our founders said, we'll cover that base with the Ninth Amendment. So the Ninth Amendment was put there to specifically state that this is why we're doing this. And we're doing this because you said, if we don't mention them, we could lose them. I've got those things here somewhere. I jumped to some of the things that, uh, in the amendments. Now the Second Amendment, and I will send it to you. I looked at my stuff here and I don't seem to be able to find it. The Second Amendment, as submitted to James Madison, was much longer. Madison pared it down. And the Second Amendment was much clearer without any confusion about militias in the way that it was submitted to Madison. Now, was there an ulterior motive on Madison's part? I don't think so. But I think he shortened it for, for whatever reason, and it made it something about a well-regulated militia that he included in there. But let's jump back to the 18th century dictionary. What did regulated mean in 1789? To make regular? Exactly. It meant to make regular. It did not mean to control. <laughs> How do you make something regular? Just well, you keep it from... Well, how do they do it in the military? Everybody wears the same clothes, everybody has the same gun, everybody has all this. That's what they meant by a well-regulated militia, to make sure that everybody was carrying the same thing with the same equipment. And so that was the well-regulated issue. Say again, I'm saying... And, and standard procedure. Yes, so it would all be uniform in nature. Because if... Uh, 
If you've actually ever been in combat, you realize how important that may become. <laughs> because when you run out of ammo, you don't want to reach for the other guy's ammo and find out he was using a different caliber. <laughs> that increases the pucker factor dramatically. Yeah. <laughs> Stormy in the enemy camp. Yes. That was one reason. One reason, and I'll, I'll jump away here for a second. So that one of the things we did in my when I was still a soldier before I got into the military intelligence field, the oxymoron of all oxymorons. We had, and I was Battalion Sergeant Major, 3rd Battalion, 75th Infantry at Fort Benning. And we instituted a course where every soldier that we had, every ranger that we had with us, could take apart any weapon known to exist at that time in any country. Wow. You could take it apart, you could put it back together, you could make it work. You found out what ammunition was in when it was interchangeable. And then we did this little thing. We had some pretty imaginative people and we did something called the Crest Test. In which we took every known weapon to exist and we took a magazine, not a clip, clips what goes in your hair. I don't use them. <laughs> we took a magazine and we put one round of ammunition in and then we took a tube of toothpaste and put a bead of Crest toothpaste. And then we put another round in and then we put another bead of toothpaste and then we put another round another bead of toothpaste. We would fill a complete magazine alternating with beads of toothpaste. Then the fun began. You're all familiar with the gritty nature of toothpaste. Oh boy. So we would pop them into the weapons and fire them on full, full automatic. You find out real quickly what weapon's going to function in a bad environment. The most rounds we ever got out of the M4, M16 configuration, the most rounds we ever got before a failure was four. Wow. The good old Kalashnikov AK-47 would go bap, 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 toothpaste flying everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it just kept working. Now, it's easy to see why when you look at the configuration, Kalashnikov was a tanker in World War I. He hated the weapons that they had, the limited weaponry that they had. He wanted to invent something that was working. He used uh, stamped rather than milled. They were real cheap pieces, but they worked in a combat situation. In a combat situation, minute of angle is not real important at 200 yards. They're usually close enough to shake hands with on many occasions. Which reminded me, what was his name? The great, ah, uh, oh, having a brain cramp. Audie Murphy. When he radioed for artillery support during World War II, and the artillery commander said, But Lieutenant, that's your position. Are the Germans that close? And Audie Murphy said, Here, I'll let you speak to them. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, they were that close. <laughs> so, now, if I may, I would like to get into, and I will send you all of the, the ninth, tenth, what they were for. The eighth, I understand some people want some clarification on. I'll get into that one. But the thing I want to go to now is this good old Constitution over here that has three amendments that were never properly ratified. Mm -hmm. yeah. 14, 16, 17. Mm -hmm. Those were never properly ratified. Now, get prepared because I'm getting ready to lean on Mr. Lincoln somewhat, but this was after he had already expired. 
When the war is over, the South elected their members of Congress and sent them to Washington, D.C. The members of the Republican Congress refused to seat any member of Congress from the South and said, no, you will not be seated. Violates the Constitution, Article 5. No one shall be denied their right in the Senate. They said, no, you cannot come into this. We will not allow you here. So they came up with the Reconstruction Act of 1867. And the Reconstruction Act divided the divided 10 of the southern states up into military districts and put them all under martial law. There was one state that was not included in those 10 that had been in the Confederacy. Does anyone know which state that was? Tennessee. Tennessee was not included in the 10 for a specific reason. Because the President of the United States at the time, Andrew Johnson, was from Tennessee. So if they would have made Tennessee a non-state and put it under martial law, he could not have remained as President. Of course, they later impeached him. We're going to tell you why they impeached him. 14th Amendment was then passed or sent around for the votes before they excluded the southern states. Before they refused to seat them, they'd sent around because the southern states had ratified the 13th. So then they refused to allow them to be seated after they sent around the 14th and every southern state had voted against the 14th Amendment. Any idea why? The 14th Amendment, I think it's section 3, says that if you had supported the Confederacy in any manner as a soldier, as a, and if you had paid taxes, you supported the southern states in rebellion, you were no longer a citizen of the United States. Mm. And you could not own property and you could not vote. So they kicked him out, said, you don't belong in this country. Two members of Congress, Theodore Stevens and Charles Sumner, proposed a bill that would have taken 85% of the land in the South for rep war reparations to pay for the war. But if you had supported the South, you could not vote, you could not own property. You were basically a non-citizen, which led to a rapid migration of people out of the South, many of them who came West and populated Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, because they no longer had any rights. So the 14th Amendment was sent around. Also, if you read the first part of the 14th Amendment, it takes us from being citizens of a state to citizens of the United States. Put us under a national form of government instead of a republic. Now, these states, 10 states that were kicked out were told, okay, whenever you guys feel like you wanna come back in, write a constitution, state constitution that we approve and agree to ratify the 14th Amendment, we'll let you back in. That's called coercion. So we brought them back in as they came back in individually, took over 12 years. So the southern states were under martial law. The southern states were raped financially and economically. There's a four volume set called Bloodstains if you want to read the complete history. Yes, sir. Didn't they kind of like pretty much kill everybody in Arkansas? That, to, um, they kicked everybody out. I, it was kind of an impression that they kind of mass murder in Arkansas. They did it in a lot of places. Uh, New Orleans was especially bad. And just to give you an illustration, by 1872, the people in New Orleans, including, or in Louisiana, including the blacks, 
had said, this is wrong. So they elected a new governor, a new lieutenant governor, who was a black man, who was extremely intelligent. They elected an entirely new government and put it in effect in 1872. Ulysses Grant had a federal judge declare their elections null and void and put his brother-in-law in as governor of the state of Louisiana. I had, when I went through um, some records, family records, there was um, some members of my family that were hung in Texas for swearing their allegiance to the original Constitution in Union. Hmm. That was in 1864. The, and I've, I could teach a whole class on this and we would be here until the middle of next week. People, the war between the states was not fought over slavery. States' rights. Abraham yes. Lincoln said in his first inaugural address, I will not tamper with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists because I do not have the power to. But if you don't pay your tariff, I will invade you. And he mentions bloodshed. Hmm. At the time, Abraham Lincoln ordered 75,000 troops to invade the southern states. There were more slaves in the border states in the north than there was in the south. So he had ordered an invasion to collect a tariff. From North Carolina? No, South Carolina. South Carolina. And as a matter of fact, the uh, Fort Sumter was not a military installation, it was a tariff collection point. So read the first inaugural address. You will see that he says, I do not. And if you want to really get all whoopy about the Emancipation Proclamation, it freed only the slaves in the South. Where he didn't have control. Yet. Where he had no control over. <clears throat> slaves in New Orleans were controlled by the federal government. They were not freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. <clears throat> trying to keep up with time here I want to make sure I cover everything so and then the beautiful part if you go to 14th amendment section 4 is the part where it says the validity of the national debt shall not be questioned <clears throat> so every time you mention the national debt and you pose a question you're violating your constitution this one. The one that wasn't ratified. So the four. Now we will jump from the 14th and all of the stuff that it did and the fact it made questioning. People, if you, there's a great book that was written by a judge in 1867. And I'm trying to think of the, his name was Henry Clay Dean. Lincoln had put him in prison for protesting the war. He was a preacher and a lawyer. What a combination. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but Henry Clay Dean wrote a great book. And it's about blood money. And he cites in that book, which was published in 1867, how the international bankers had financed both sides of that war and had accumulated such a debt in this country that it was overwhelming. <clears throat> and they financed both sides. What a great way to be. What a great way to make money. They still do. And they still do. Mm -hmm. Same yeah. thing. So there we, there we had it. So, the 14th is invalid, shouldn't be there. And it's been used for so many things, you know. They love to jump on it. Oh, well, it, it, it gives us due process clause. People, the due process clause is in the original Constitution. You don't need the 14th Amendment for a due process clause. All right, then we've got the wonderful 16th Amendment. 
one that brought us the income tax, reinstated the income tax that Lincoln instituted to pay for his war, and the funny money he printed to use, which we're still doing, printing funny money.